Welcome all to another edition of Aliyev Watch, where we unpack some of the statements of Azerbaijani President Ilham Aliyev. Today we'll be looking at some of the statements Aliyev made in a BBC interview during the Second Karabakh War, as well as from a summit that took place in the Turkish city of Konya and some other instances. Joining me is Civilnet host and analyst, Eric Hakopyan. It's a pleasure. Thank you for joining me. Eric, let's listen to this quote. Because Human Rights Watch, due to uh, a very biased approach to Azerbaijan, due to the fact that they did not uh, notice any wrongdoing in Armenia, even when journalists are dying in prison, even when main opposition leader is in prison. They don't report on that. So it's interesting. He's raising concerns about the state of democracy in Armenia because the journalist is questioning Azerbaijan's level of democracy, saying that Armenia is a democracy. Uh, he doesn't want uh, the world to think that Armenia is a democracy, perhaps. Um, how do you think Aliyev perceives Armenian democracy? Uh, Aliyev perceives Armenian democracy as a threat because obviously the biggest threat of a democracy to an undemocratic state is an issue of legitimacy. And this is a man who's never won an honest election. In fact, in his country, election results have been reported the day before the election. So um, the fact that Armenia is a democratic state is quite problematic for him, both in the imagery of the country and on where he stands. Uh, and his people obviously are not stupid. They see the political systems that their two neighbors have democratic political systems where people come and go. And here you have this, uh, you know, this ugly clans that own the country and have owned it for decades. Hmm. So this is an issue of legitimacy and it's, you know, he's trying to uh, muddy the waters when he has absolutely no legitimacy on the issue. Obviously there are no political prisoners in Armenia and there are no uh, opposition leaders in jail or journalists in jail for doing journalism. Hmm. Okay, Eric, let's have a listen to this one. Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh will live much better. They will have more salaries because the salary in Azerbaijan is higher, more pensions because pension in Azerbaijan is three times higher in Armenia. They will have all the social protection. We will invest in those areas largely. But they will, will get will rid they of have, poverty. Will they have the full range of human rights which people here in Azerbaijan do not have? Will they have a fully free media? Will they have an opposition that's allowed to raise its voice? Will they be allowed to have things that people here in Azerbaijan do not have? Uh, you think they do not have it? Why do you think that people in Azerbaijan do not have free media and opposition? Because this is what I'm told by independent sources in this country. Which independent sources? Many independent sources. <laughs> Tell me which. I certainly couldn't name sources. Oh, if you couldn't name, that means yeah. that you're just inventing this story. So you're saying the media is not under state control? Not at all. And there is a vibrant free opposition media? Where, of course. Where, where do I see this? You can see it in the internet. You can see it everywhere. But not in newspapers. Why? You can see it in newspapers. Whom do you call opposition here? Can I ask you? Well, is there allowed to be an opposition here? Yeah, it is allowed, of course. I mean, NGOs are the subject of a crackdown. Journalists no. are the subject of a crackdown. Not at all. Critics are in jail. No, not at all. None of this is true. Absolutely fake. Absolutely. We have free media. We have free internet. So going on from his perception of Armenian democracy, he is now lauding Azerbaijani democracy and claiming that Azerbaijan has free media, has uh, experience no crackdown. It reminds me of other dictators which tell Western journalists that they do not understand the system of democracy in their own country. So what do you think when hearing this? Well, we shouldn't overanalyze it. <clears throat> On the one level, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's almost a psychological need that uh, people who are uh, despots, you know, uh, they have the opportunity to lie and not be challenged. And you're supposed to sort of take it. Uh, and uh, they have the, the, the opportunity to lie and humiliate you, and that's what they think. But on the second handle, uh, the reason that he's denying this so much is because every totalitarian state in the world is very, uh, they're into formal legalisms. Mm. Uh, for example, you know, there's elections in North Korea. There were elections during Stalin's time. Uh, it's because uh, it's an issue of legitimacy. So down deep in his heart, he understands that he is not a legitimate leader. He understands that his state is not, that his state structures are not legitimate. Uh, so he, he, this is almost this democratic envy. Uh, mm. Obviously, he knows it isn't true. The interviewer knows it's true. And the people who are watching this know it isn't true. Right. Uh, but it is something that he is compelled to say because every other totalitarian state, whether a leader, whether it's uh, Gaddafi, whether it's Saddam, whether it's Pol Pot or whoever are going to have to say the same thing or something along these lines. So mm. 
this is not surprising, but this is a power projection of him being able to lie. And secondly, uh, the fact that he completely lacks legitimacy, and this is the way and democratization or the appearance of it is what gives states legitimacy, even if it's entirely made up. Okay, um, Eric, listen to the next one. This is very interesting. But if you raise this question, can I ask you also one? How do you uh, assess what happened to Mr. Assange? Is it a reflection of free media in your country? We're not here to discuss no, my let's country. Discuss, no, let's discuss. No, President In order Ali. to accuse me, saying that Armenians will not have free uh, media here, let's talk about Assange. How many years, sorry, how many years he spent in Ecuadorian embassy? And for what? And where is he now? For journalistic activity. You kept that person hostage, actually killing him morally and physically. You did it, not us, and now he's in prison. So you have no moral right to talk about free media when you do these things. Returning to the conflict, how Yeah, long... better return to the conflict, because this is not what you like. You like only to accuse, only to attack. But look at the mirror. Look, I tell many times, before coming and lecturing us, and in your question, accusing me, it's not a question, it's accusation. You talk like a prosecutor. Why? If you're so democratic and so objective, why you keep Assange in prison? Okay, Eric, this is one of the most important bits of the interview, in my opinion, because uh, for many of the people who do not know or don't remember, he is talking about the case of Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, which published US government leaks. He was then held up in the Ecuadorian embassy in London and is to be extradited to the US. This excerpt of this interview went viral. It racked up hundreds of thousands of views on different platforms, on TikTok, Telegram, Instagram. These are some of the comments which were under the video. Great president showing the hypocrisy of America. He is a woke president. Aliyev is handing the BBC journalist her rear end. Um, what do you think about Aliyev bringing up the case of Julian Assange um, when being questioned about free media? Well, first of all, whoever is praising him, the, the classic phrase, you know, Lenin's classic phrase of useful idiots, that's what they are, given the fact that you know, this is all hypocrisy. Uh, he's obviously, obviously, uh, personally, I, I do not think Mr. Assange should be prosecuted and everything against him is unjust. It's actually something that every authoritarian system throws at the West because it's an unjust prosecution. That, however, does not justify their own repression. It just becomes an excuse for it. Uh, but there's something very interesting. He he is uh, he's absolutely correct in the sense that uh, his state does not try to extradite uh, journalists from abroad. Uh, doesn't try doesn't uh, go through the legal process to do so. His state simply murders journalists abroad. Uh, or in the in the case of uh, Lapshin, and I think there was another Azeri journalist that they kidnapped in, in Georgia, Afghan something, I forget his mm -hmm. last name. They simply kidnapped them, uh, tortured them, and prosecute them. So yes, he does not, uh, whatever you think of the Assange situation, I do not think he should be pursued as he is. He should He's a journalist and should be able to do his job. Uh, uh, however, uh, in this case, even in this case that they're wrong about, they're actually going through a legal process to bring him back to the country, and it's not the CIA that's kidnapping him or assassinating him, which is his government's program. So uh, let's just say yeah, he's in no position to talk about this issue in any uh, moral sense. Mm. There was also Bayram who was drowned in yeah. Istanbul. I want to also ask, you've spoken in the past a lot about the narratives and the importance of PR and narratives when it comes to Armenia saying that Armenian cause is part and parcel of the anti-racism cause, mm -hmm. that Armenia is a democracy in a sea of tyranny. You have said these points many times. Isn't he kind of doing the same thing, but from the opposite side? He's taking the West's hypocrisy and throwing it in their, in their face and then getting applause from people in the West. Yeah, as I said, this is, this is normal of all. I mean, if you look at Chinese media, if, if you look at states that are not democratic, or somewhat authoritarian in different levels, uh, or even Turkish media. They'll always mm -hmm. pick point, pick whatever uh, failures are, are part of the West. And many of them are real, just like this one. And they'll try to use that as a justification, which is the best reason why the West should not be prosecuting Julian Assange, if mm -hmm. they're actually serious about these issues. However, I mean, you have to look at this in a, in a universal sense. Uh, the fact that he uses these... Uh, what might be good talking points does not justify the uh, repressive and fascist nature of his regime. Mm. 
And a few more quotes, which are from a uh, summit in the Turkish city of Konya, which I will read out. Um, the first, Aliyev is talking about education. He says, education in turn is also important. Um, it raises patriots who will return the lands, of course, high motivation. We motivated them. If you ask me what is the most important thing among them, I can say I'm absolutely convinced that it is determination. Aliyev is talking about the importance of education. Mm -hmm. I what in in what sense is education important for Aliyev? Well, I think this is exceptionally revealing mm. what he says. Obviously, and there's no, there's hardly any totalitarian state that wants their people educated in a classical sense. Right. Yes, physics, this or that. So well, what he means by education here is actually the systematic teaching of hatred. Mm. Uh, one of the things that he has done is to make. Uh, ethnic hatred, Armenophobia, is state policy and it's part of their education program to the extent that Armenians don't belong here, they're this, they're that, they're migrants to this region, they're not natives to Artsakh, and just constant level of hateful education. So what he's actually saying here in a coded way mm. is that what succeeded was our hate campaign, mm. is that we created an enemy and to the extent that people were willing to make sacrifices uh, driven by hatred and by racism uh, and by bigotry uh, to commit war crimes and do other things for us to win the war. Mm. So this is this is actually he's actually quite revealing. Except the word isn't education; it's actually hatred. Right. And finally, Eric um, Aliyev on multiple occasions speaks about Armenian revanchism mm -hmm. or irredentism, which is the idea that there are lands outside your borders which which you claim. Uh, why do you think he keeps bringing up Armenian revanchism? It's psychological projection because his entire his entire political career is revanchism. This is he is the man that and stopped this uh, issue being settled in two thousand and one. His father had agreed to the Key West uh, proposals, mm. which would have been a, a fair end and an end to this war. Armenia leaves all of the occupied, liberated territories, however you want to call it, and Artsakh essentially becomes part of Armenia. Uh, and the, the issue's over, and that's that. And it's a fair uh, end to this conflict. He's the one who killed it, because he understood that for him to rule, uh, he needed an external enemy, and he needed hatred to actually build his regime, since obviously he knows that a regime like his cannot deliver the goods to his people. So he, he, he what he is fearing is what his life plan was. So it's very hard... He does, he's not very credible to say that revanchism doesn't work when his entire political essence and career is revanchism. Uh, he's also telling you what he fears. Mm. Uh, and what he fears is revanchism as he sees it. Uh, and I can tell you, uh, uh, Armenia is going to have a garrison state, and, and the father of that garrison state is going to be Ilhan Aliyev. So he actually is going to get his, uh, what he's projecting he's going to get based on his actions and his statements. That's the most ironic part of all this. Mm. Well, Eric, insightful as always. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, it was a pleasure. And thank you for joining us on CivilNet.